Afghanistan. War in the Hindu Kush. A war fought by the Soviet Union to prevent the spread of Islamic fundamentalism. Like Vietnam, a conflict dominated by the helicopter gunship. Unlike Vietnam, a hit-and-run guerrilla war, not all rebels could agree how to win. And one fought in often atrocious conditions for which the Soviets were untrained and unprepared. Afghanistan is a remote, landlocked country whose closeness to Iran's Islamic revolution scared the Kremlin. It's also a wild, mountainous country with few metal roads. This lack of easy communications dictated a two-pronged invasion to secure the capital, Kabul, and the towns along the road system. The invasion was personally supervised by Marshal Sergei Sokolov, the Soviet's deputy defense minister. Extensively experienced as a wartime tank general, he was a hawkish commander, but a conservative tactician who soon faced a federation of 24 major guerrilla groups. 1,800 T-62 tanks transported from the plains of Soviet Turkestan to the edge of the Hindu Kush mountains. It's New Year 1980 and a Soviet army occupies a neighboring country. This was the limited contingent of Soviet forces in Afghanistan, the 40th Army, numbering 80,000 men now, but rising in time to 152,000, one-third the strength of United States forces at their peak in Vietnam. Over 2,000 armored fighting vehicles now began to make their presence felt on Afghanistan's few roads. More effective were the MI-8 helicopter gunships, which would soon become symbolic of this war. On land, though, the Soviets entered Afghanistan completely unprepared for the conflict that developed, with the wrong organization and unsuitably heavy weapons. They said they'd been invited in to repel foreign intervention after a coup. In truth, President Hafizullah Amin was killed in his Darulaman palace, not by Afghans, but by Soviet special forces, the Spetsnaz. His crime had been pushing reform too quickly, making a traditionalist Soviet ally vulnerable to Islamic revolution. But even as they established radio communications, the message was getting back that this would be no easy intervention. The problem was the Afghan army, already demoralized by rebel attacks since communists seized power two years earlier. As the New Year blizzards swept in, so did the realization that this army was close to collapse. Now, the Soviets were forced onto the offensive as resistance grew sharply. This deeply traditional and xenophobic people, already alienated by Afghanistan's communists, grew more hostile because the new regime proved totally dependent on a foreign power. Many fled the towns to join the resistance and fight the invaders, the total exodus soon numbering hundreds of thousands. A major target would be the Soviets' main supply route to Kabul as it twisted through the Salang Pass and Tunnel. This three-kilometer structure was built to shelter the road from avalanches, but vulnerable to sabotage and ambush. But already split by tribes, the Mujahideen were soon divided further by rivalries for foreign patronage in money and weapons. They began with rifles last used against the British a century before, Lee Enfields, some made in Pakistan. There in the border town of Peshawar, a busy cottage industry sprang up as gunsmiths opened tiny workshops to make exact copies of all sorts of firearms. United States funding paid for firearms orders of up to 30,000 weapons at a time. Salesmen eagerly demonstrated their copies of the British Sten gun stored over racks of reproduction Lee Enfield rifles. Some weapons were more ingenious, like this firearm disguised as a walking stick. Several government officials would be assassinated in Afghanistan's capital. 
They also displayed captured Soviet weapons, especially the heavy machine guns central to many a Mujahideen attack. But most popular of all were the Kalashnikovs, known as Kalikovs by the rebels, who swore to fight or die. We want to fulfill our duties, and if we uh, are killed, we are killed in the way of God Almighty. So we haven't lost anything. It's a victory by itself. So we uh, are determined to fight to the last. The resistance concentrated much of its efforts close to the border with Pakistan, where Peshawar offered sanctuary and supplies. The Salang Pass and the Panjshir Valley saw concentrated action by Mujahideen groups reinforced along several key border routes. In early 1980, the Mujahideen resistance controlled 90% of the countryside, though popular outrage at the invasion provided more volunteers than they could arm. Most remained locally based, however, rarely communicating with other groups or operating outside their own valleys. The Dushmans, as the Soviets called the Mujahideen, would be slow to develop sophisticated strategies going beyond simple hit-and-run tactics. Helicopter patrols were one hazard of infiltration in these border valleys. Skilled at evasion, these Mujahideen could regard the interruption as a welcome rest on the arduous trek across the Kunar Valley. With no jungles or marshes to conceal movement, they took pride in their ability to melt into crevices in the craggy landscape. This simple craft gave them domination of the area. A Soviet armored patrol negotiates the rough valley road. Heavy armor frequently spearheaded divisional raids on rebel mountain strongholds until the Soviets realized that they often lacked the gun elevation to engage the Mujahideen, yet remained vulnerable to rebels' rocket-propelled grenades. The destruction of villages and a series of Soviet offensives sharply depopulated the valleys. Here in the Panjshir, up to 50,000 people fled their homes, moving 80 kilometers into the high valleys, 3,000 meters up in the mountains. With no homes, many were reduced to living in caves. Mujahideen infiltrating along the river found that, with work stopped on the land, food supplies were badly disrupted. And they already faced natural hazards that divided Mujahideen groups one from another. The logistics of moving men and munitions under these conditions severely handicapped the ability of many rebel groups to stage sustained operations. Patrolling helicopters had another role too. Thousands of butterfly anti-personnel mines were dropped to disrupt Mujahideen movements. Soviet strike jets added their firepower, called in here in retaliation for a Mujahideen ambush. But it was usually the villagers that suffered, not the rebels. In a lull, they move on towards another objective. Unlike the Viet Cong, which was created to fight a guerrilla war in South Vietnam, the Afghan resistance had grown spontaneously. But it lacked the unifying equivalent of a Vu Nien Jia with practical battle experience. And this lack of a central command prevented strategic planning and the efficient use of resources. Mujahideen lay in ambush in the strategic Salang Pass. Most understood the shock value of the ambush, relying on it as their basic tactic. They were reasonably good at this form of action, usually targeting oil convoys as they hurried south to Kabul. This time, Afghan troops, whose lorry has been stopped, prepare to surrender.
the Mujahideen order them to throw down their weapons. A shaven head indicates a young conscript. If he doesn't join the rebels, he'll be escorted to a Pakistani refugee camp. In their War of the Roads, the Mujahideen destroyed thousands of trucks along this vital supply route, causing severe fuel shortages in the capital. A glance at the instruction book and two rebels prepared to launch a rocket attack. In this most casual of strikes, rockets were aimed merely by being propped against rocks and fired by wires stuck to the casing with airstrip. This haphazard approach meant that sometimes the effects were simply a nuisance. Sometimes they hit civilian areas. But they also hit the airport, disrupting the Soviet Union's vital air links. And burning fuel meant that more convoys would have to run the gauntlet of the now infamous Salang Pass. But the most spectacular result of one of these hit-and-run raids was the strike on a SAM missile dump at Karga, just outside Kabul. Forty people were killed as the long crescendo of explosions devastated the site. The Soviets denied it was the result of a rebel attack, but later took steps to improve security. After 20 minutes, the massive series of explosions grew to a climax. The approaches to Anava, an important Soviet-Afghan base in the Panjshir Valley. It was from here that counterinsurgency measures were planned and carried out. Heavily bunkered, their defensive attitude soon became regarded as a drain on manpower. So Afghan troops were given a greater part as Soviet thoughts turned gradually to withdrawal. And Afghanistan's often miserable weather sapped the morale of the troops charged with mounting those sweeps. At first, Soviet patrols moved without much skill or imagination. Like all convoys, they were reduced to the speed of the slowest member. Rare pictures of the Soviet column reconnoitering the Panjshir graphically show the difficulties presented by the terrain and the easy targets these slow-moving convoys made for an ambush. In time, Soviet infantry firepower was sharply increased by the introduction of the AGS-17 automatic grenade launcher. And though this ensured that as many as 10 rebels died for every soldier, their own toll was already sapping the Kremlin's resolve at home. But it was here that the Soviets met the rebel leader who most readily grasped the more advanced theories of guerrilla war, Ahmad Shah Massoud. Moving quickly from simple hit-and-run tactics, he organized mobile forces to counter-attack Soviet assault forces and draw units into side valleys, diluting their effort. He observed their advance from high ground, ambushing them at bottlenecks that slowed the advancing columns, creating stationary targets. Ahmad Shah Massoud had quickly proved to be a popular and charismatic leader. 
Although he learned guerrilla war from books, he became an effective, shrewd strategist who was undefeated by the Soviets in nine campaigns. He graduated from hit-and-run attacks to the capture of strategic government outposts outside his own area, starting with his assault on Peshkur in 1985. Such forts were defended by several hundred troops armed with howitzers and dug-in tanks and protected by minefields, sandbagged in placements and barbed wire networks. Showing a mature grasp of tactics, his men outflanked the defences before breaching them. Massoud's success stemmed from being one of only two rebel leaders who organised full-time, fully paid, properly trained guerrilla forces. Called Motorax, they were the resistance's first truly mobile units, allowing Massoud to concentrate forces against the most important garrisons and take them. Equally important, he established a unique esprit de corps, as a senior aide explained. Leadership is very important in a guerrilla warfare. He has become and proved to be a charismatic guerrilla leader of Afghans inside Afghanistan. He also shrewdly assessed Soviet strengths as well as their weaknesses. When they invaded Afghanistan, they came with very heavy weapons, which were wrong for this mountainous terrain. But later, they began using helicopters and very light weapons. In my opinion, Russian tactics have improved each year. Now their forces are noticeably more mobile, but their morale is noticeably lower because a lot of Russians have been killed in Afghanistan. The attack on Peshkur in his native Panjshir Valley established Massoud's new ability to take strongly held fortified positions. Held by 500 men, it was thought proof against guerrilla attack, but Massoud had other ideas. <laughs> Massoud's well-organized attack involving up to 500 Mujahideen went in at dusk to avoid the attentions of Soviet helicopter gunships. Our main plan for Pushkur is firstly to cut off the aerial and ground supply routes and then capture the ten outposts surrounding the main base. Finally, we will pour heavy weapons fire onto the main base until it's been captured or destroyed. It was an exploit distinguished by skillful coordination of men using radios, by well-organized supporting firepower and surprise tactics. Despite careful planning, fighting went on into the night before the fort and all its outposts fell to the Mujahideen. Massoud's prisoners included 110 officers and NCOs, but the most important, an Afghan chief of staff, had been killed in the fighting. Massoud, having made his point, abandoned the fort. After questioning, the officers were taken to a Mujahideen prison higher up the valley, but all died during the Soviets' counter-attack, shot, it's believed, by their guards. The American Stinger anti-aircraft missile, the weapon most credited with giving the Mujahideen an edge in the war, just under two meters long, it weighs 17 kilos, and despite needing 136 hours training, the rebels soon mastered it. Its highly explosive warhead travels at twice the speed of sound and uses an infrared seeker to intercept its target at a maximum range of six kilometers. 
This one blew up without finding its target. And although the CIA who supplied it said it achieved a 70% kill rate, some, including Massoud, felt its impact exaggerated. But Soviet jets did have to fly higher and faster, making their bombing less effective, except when rebels assembled for rare mass attacks. And helicopters took to low flying in valleys, realizing Stinger could not be fired downwards from the positions Mujahideen usually adopted. Increasing use was made of anti-missile flares. It meant that the Soviet and Afghan forces lost their ability to control the air, giving the Mujahideen far greater freedom of action. Increasing convoys of helicopters and aircraft that had been shot down bore witness to some Mujahideen successes. But it remains a fact that the Soviets lost their frontline strike aircraft at a lower rate than the Germans were doing in training. South of Kabul, Soviet and Afghan forces mounted one of their biggest operations to break a guerrilla siege of Khost in Paktia province and smash their mountain strongholds at Zawa and elsewhere. 2,000 Soviet troops backed a 10,000-man Afghan army task force commanded by the Afghan general staff. Having failed in a previous attempt to break resistance in that area, the government had decided to leave nothing to chance. But the show of heavy armor and artillery obscured the fact that the Soviets were, by now, committed to withdrawal. The assault was backed by the MI-24, regarded as the world's most formidable helicopter gunship, as symbolic of this war as the United States' Hueys in Vietnam. Its operational costs, though, were three times higher. Soviet pilots exhibited similar bravado. If it wasn't dangerous, we wouldn't be doing it, he said. The brand new Suhoi Su-25 Frogfoot, armed with cluster bombs and 57mm rockets, proved to be the Soviets' most effective ground attack jet. Suhoi's and MiGs spearheaded the airstrikes against the guerrillas' mountain strongholds, flying from Russian border bases as well as Afghan airfields. Their flight paths took them over a landscape that was cold and forbidding, even in an Afghan spring. These mountainous areas were controlled by several guerrilla groups, headed by the fundamentalist Hezbi Islami, Previous attempts to dislodge them had failed, lulling them into a false sense of impregnability. Increasingly heavy air attacks softened up the guerrillas' positions. The rocket-propelled grenade was an optimistic anti-aircraft weapon. Flak narrowly misses a swooping Su-25. Its parachute-retarded anti-personnel bombs seek their target. Flares were released to deflect the British blowpipe missiles that were in use. These Soviet-designed 12.7mm Dashika heavy machine guns were a favoured anti-aircraft weapon. They claimed at least three helicopters and a fighter. But Soviet helicopters had now acquired armour-plated protection, limiting the effectiveness of these weapons. After days of constant use, anti-aircraft fire became increasingly inaccurate. The defenders had fired so many rounds that they had worn out their gun barrels. The Soviets said they destroyed over 250 Mujahideen fortifications in three weeks of bitter fighting. Fuel air incendiaries were particularly effective. But Mujahideen supplies continued to reach hidden positions as the rebels regrouped. Some even received pre-prepared airline meals flown in from Saudi Arabia.
the Mujahideen dug fresh networks of trenches and dugouts as others laid minefields out of sight of the new strongholds. The war's one set-piece battle had proved that they could be defeated, but their ability, like the Viet Cong, to regroup beyond national borders meant the Soviet and Afghan forces could not win an outright victory. By the winter of 1987, the Soviets were forced to move as Host came under renewed siege. 40,000 people and an 8,000-strong garrison quickly ran short of food. Minefields slowed the progress of Operation Magistral to one kilometer a day. 18,000 men were on the move, a strong combined arms force including paratroops, artillery and motorized riflemen backed by helicopter gunships. Once more they were backed by some of the most effective airstrikes of the war. The sequence of bombs, then anti-missile flares, was by now routine. The airstrikes continued relentlessly for over a week. Some parachute-retarded cluster bombs mixed chemical and anti-personnel explosives. On land, too, enormous firepower was brought down by artillery and long-range missiles and rockets. But a journey that in peacetime would have taken 30 hours had already taken 32 days, further complicated by well-prepared Mujahideen ambushes. Scouts observe the slowly advancing convoys as a Mujahideen digs in prior to staging an ambush. The water will prevent rising dust revealing the position of the recoilless rifle crew. Though very efficient at ambush tactics, lack of command coordination meant that too many of these attacks were less effective than they might have been. Soviets dug in at the edge of the village, lay down covering fire. Finally, the MI-24 gunships come in to suppress the guerrillas. Around the notorious Sato Kandao Pass, rebels had constructed a formidable system of bases and sangars, rock-built weapons emplacements. They were positions which could have been held by a professional army against a much larger force. Eighteen.